even made a mistake. <laughs> How many of you even made a mistake? Feet up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. How many are still here? So even your worst mistake didn't kill you. Think about it for a moment. Even your worst mistake didn't kill you. Look at your neighbor and say, there's hope for me. <laughs> Amen. Because you see, so many times, people are talking about this perfect life in Christ. And it ain't getting there in a heartbeat. It takes time. It takes discipline. It takes commitment. Thanks, Christine. That, that guy wants me to get too far into the text. Now we've been six weeks in the book of Colossians and we're only in chapter 2. Wow. Why? Because the words are lives. Amen. Good to have everybody here this morning. It's good the families together. Amen. Amen. Yes. Those that are not with us today for other reasons and commitments, we pray for them. But the family, we miss them. Amen. Amen. This place is empty at the table because family didn't come. They robbed us of a blessing. They robbed us of a blessing. Is that right? Yes. They robbed us of a blessing. But it's okay, we love them. I want to get into the word this morning, then we're going to worship. And Liam was talking about Tuesday night. And as we were ministering Tuesday night, I couldn't preach no more. That doesn't often happen to many preachers. Because they want to speak, see. They were given the voice. They were good football players. They're given the legs and the skill. Good rugby players are given the body and the brawn. Good preachers are given the gift of the gap. But I couldn't speak. Because even though it was a virtual broadcast, the presence of God came in that room. And I just, and it was hard for me. I was sitting there with all the cameras and all the stuff on for the broadcast. And I just wanted to get off my chair and go lay on the floor and pray. But I didn't have anybody there to move the camera. So I had to stay at this chair. And it was so hard to stay in the chair. I want to tell you, we're moving into something so supernatural. And there's nothing new in the Word. It's all here already. We're, we're getting back into a season in God. Like they had in that book that you can't pronounce. <laughs> in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. <laughs> <laughs> when the power of God came into their meeting, when the power of God came into the tabernacle, where they couldn't stand because of the cloud. They couldn't stand before the presence and because of the presence of God. Are you thirsty and hungry for that presence? Are we hungry and thirsty for that presence? Or do we just want some goosebumps? Lack of feeling. Can someone just, just check on look? Won't somebody just take a key? The, John, thank you. Take the, the key. The remote is there on the table. Thank you. Will somebody thank just check John. vehicles? Thank you. To always be sensitive. The angels is there. To always just be sensitive and safe. Amen. So as we get into the book, continue in Colossians, chapter two. We've we got. We started last week in chapter 2 after spending a few weeks in chapter 1 and we got as far as verse 5. So today I want to start again in verse 6 and carry on building. You know, it's only got three chapters, four chapters. But it's like Ephesians, it's one of those books, one of those epistles that is so loaded with truth. Have you ever looked, have you ever looked at a fruit basket? It's just so loaded with beautiful fruit, different color, and all that beauty. And then you look at a basket with something else in it, there's all one color. The gospel is a fruit basket of beautiful, precious, and lovely fruit. If we just read it, dig into it, 
It's appetizing. So, as Paul is ministering to the Colossians, and remember, just for understanding, Paul had never been to Colossae. He'd never been to the church here in, 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 in the Colossians. But he's speaking as an apostle. He's speaking to them, admonishing them, lifting them up, encouraging them, and telling them some stuff that they've, they've never met him. But he's speaking straight into their lives, straight into their hearts, straight into their souls. And he's going to pick it up in verse 6. As you have received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in him. As you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk in Him. First thing I want to talk about this morning is, how have we received Jesus Christ? How have we received Jesus? And you know, when I started reading that, now remember, this is the New Testament church, in the early ages, under the, under the governance of the Ascension Apostles, they didn't have internet, they didn't have YouTube, they didn't have Facebook. It was word of mouth many times how the gospel was spread was through word of mouth. Even Paul himself hadn't got there yet to go preach to them face to face. But he written them this letter, see? And it, and it dropped in my spirit. Because I'm, I'm an analytical guy. I like to analyze things. I like to know why they are, not just so or so. Because if it's just so or so, you don't know why when it's tested. It might fall apart in your life. If you're in a marriage, when do you know that that marriage is secure and safe? When it's tested. Because otherwise you can just roll, it, roll along happily, 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 and you think it's okay. But when it gets tested, that's when you realize how close it is, or in fact how not so close it is. Am I right? Me. But if you ask somebody, if I had to say to you this morning, who's got the best marriage? Everybody should put up their hand, but you didn't. Why? See, let's go back to the fundamental principles for a marriage for a moment. Lord, thank you. If you go back and analyze, why did you get married? Well, it was romantic. My parents were pushing me to get married because I was getting a bit old. I wanted children and this biological clock was ticking. Now folks, you've got to understand something. Sad as it is, those are some of the reasons people have got married. Men on a large scale, they get married because they don't want to be alone. Men don't do lo alone well. <laughs> they, they don't. Woman, a spinster, she can be on her own for years and not worry about it. A man, he battles with it. Why? Because in Genesis 1, God took a woman out of the side of a man and said, I'm putting you back together as one. Man had a fundamental desire to be one. And when it's not fulfilled in the spirit, it's a hamos. Excuse my Afrikaans. <laughs> but why do we get married? Why do we take on a job? Why do we choose a career? There has to be a reason. Otherwise, it's just summa so. I watch people. I like decisive people. Are you a decisive person? Are you a decisive person? Or are we procrastinators? What do you want to eat? Um, 
I don't know, uh, 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 anything. Wow. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> you see, you should at all levels be decisive in what you want. Come on, somebody. I mean. Paul writes here, he says, as you have received Christ, walk in Him. How did you receive Christ? Did you receive Christ? See, this is important, see. When we receive Christ because somebody pushed us into Christianity instead of another religious order, that's how you receive Christ. If you receive Christ one day because you were desperate and you were on your last and you were about to pop a hundred pills and somebody said, just give your life to Jesus. How did you receive Christ this morning? Now I'm glad you received Christ, amen? You see, back in the 70s and 80s, there was a great push of certain ministries that were great and, and they made films, The Thief of the Night. Does anybody ever remember that film? And it was a film about, quote, unquote, brackets, parentheses, underline, strike it out, the rapture. And thousands and thousands of people came and got saved, made a commitment to Jesus, not because they loved Jesus, because they were scared to go to hell. They were scared to be left behind. How did you receive Jesus? And when I was doing my studies, I did a let me call it my thesis. On people that got saved in that dispensation of the fear gospel, the turn and burn gospel, many of those people fell away from serving God. Why? Because it was motivated by fear and not by the love of God. Obedience is not out of fear that God's going to whip you up. Obedience is out of worship to the God you love. Amen. How, Paul asked them, how did you receive Christ? How did you receive Him? What is it that made you come to serve the Lord your God? Today I ask you this morning, when do you want to be in fellowship with the family? What makes you want to be in fellowship in the family? It's because I love God and I love the family. Amen? Amen? Not I've got to go to church. It's the right thing to do. So Paul starts in this section of, of the letter. He says, as you have received Christ, walk in Him. Now, the way you've received Christ, ultimately, is the way you've walked in Him until somebody puts the light on if you've been slightly off channel offline and you get back into the center of it and how you live and you walk is how you receive Christ think about it for a minute. if you came to Jesus in the fear gospel how do you walk in him in fear yeah. if you came out of the multi-choice gospel how do you walk in him <laughs> confused a little bit of this and a little bit of that but if you came to Jesus because the love of God drew you. Come on. The power of God put us on our knees, put us on our face. You will want to be like that every day of your life. Amen. I want to question you this morning. I challenge you this morning to ask you, how did you receive Jesus? And if it wasn't because of the love of God, I want you to change it. Repent of it. I thank God you're saved. I thank God you made a commitment to Jesus. But I want you to serve Jesus because you love Him. Because you worship Him. Because everything in your being can't stop you raising your hands. Whether you're tired, whether you're hungry, whether you're busy, it doesn't matter. Lord, I will put all that aside. I'll put all that down. And Lord, I will just come and worship you. Come on, somebody. Amen. Say amen. Jesus, let's carry on. Because He's building on a theme. He says, as, as you receive Christ, walk in Him, rooted, established, and built up in Him, established in the faith, as 
you have been taught. I want to ask you a question this morning. Take a piece of paper after the service, unless you've got paper now. I want you to be honest with yourself. Write down who taught you faith. Write down who taught you faith. Because some people preach it, but don't teach it. Some people preach, and that goes for all the doctrines of Christ, the nine fundamental doctrines of the, of the gospel. Some people teach it, but they don't understand it, and they don't live it. Who taught you? Who taught you faith? Who taught you love? Who taught you worship? Who taught you the fundamental principles of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ? You see, many of us came out of a religious era, a religious dispensation that didn't teach the truth of the gospel. Now thank God we're now, now in charismatic renewal, we're now in apostolic reformation, wherever you are right now. But I ask you to go back and examine the fundamental principles of the doctrines in your life so that you need to test them. Because the day they're under pressure is the day that you're going to need to understand whether they stand or they fail. Let me give you an example, the pro probably one of the easiest ones. Healing. I know some good men of God, great men of God. But they'll preach that sickness, you know, God allows sickness in your life to teach you something. doesn't want sickness in our lives Amen. to teach us something. Amen. God gave us the Holy Spirit in our lives to teach us all things. Amen. That's sickness. Do we get sick sometimes? Yes. Do we go through literally the valley of the shadow of death sometimes? Yes. But it's not God who put those things there. It's the enemy who came to rob, to kill and to destroy. It's the enemy that came to spoil and to, to corrupt and to break down. Jesus said, I came to give you peace. But you see, when people pray amiss and they pray wrongly, and they've got unforgiveness in their heart, and the power of God is not operational in their lives, they justify their situation and turn scripture around to make it a doctrine. Who taught you faith? Who taught you on divine healing? See, a couple of years ago when the, when the doctors and blessed their hearts, they gave me the diagnosis that I had two tumors in my body and I had cancer and all that stuff that went with it. I thank God that my doctrine of faith and my doctrine of healing was already established. And I could go immediately to that foundation and I could go immediately to that doctrine and I could stand on it. Imagine if I take a lump of steel. Okay, imagine this is a lump of steel. It's going to be a sword. If I give this, if this was a lump of steel, this is a microphone, but just use your imagination. If this was a lump of steel, well, you can throw it at somebody. If you get up close enough, you can hit them alongside the head with it. But as a sword right now, it's absolutely no good. Come on. But if I give this lump of steel to the blacksmith, who's a skilled worker of metal, he'll put this lump of steel in the furnace. And he will heat it up, see? And he'll bring it out and he'll take his hammer and he'll put this lump of steel on the anvil and he'll start working the steel. Until after a short while, he's flattened it out, he's elongated it, he's shaped it and starts to look like a sword. Now when do I need that sword? Before I go into battle. Not when the battle starts, I can't run around and look for the blacksmith. With my, with my lump. Hey, hey, can somebody make this into a, 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 a sword for me? 
So it's too late then. God wants us to go back. I want to tell you this persecution that the world is bringing against the church. There's a lot of things in the atmosphere and the spirit that's been twisted and turned and aligned as it were. That's the devil. To bring great persecution against the church. The Bible says the weapons of all warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the putting down of those struggles. When do we need to know how to use those weapons? When you train soldiers, you go to battle camp and you train young cadets and young soldiers in and any of you that ever went into any military service, you know that battle camp or the first phase of training was 12 hard weeks. And only after those 12 weeks did they send you to the next level for another 12 weeks to learn to be a good soldier. You don't take a guy the first day, dress him, shave his head, stick him in a uniform, give him a gun and send him off to the front line. You'll get him killed. There's too many Christians that haven't been through battle camp. There's too many Christians that don't know how to use the weapons of their warfare. And they're trying to fight on the front line. That's why they become casualties. Let's continue. As you have been taught. Folks, I want to ask you to go back and search your doctrines. Are you comfortable with your doctrine? Does your doctrine align to the Word of God? With absoluteness. Not some of it. Not other of it. Does it align with absoluteness? to the principles of God. Because you see, the devil's like a roaring lion walking around, looking where there's a gap, where he can get in. You can have all the front sorted out. You can have all the armor sorted out, and you left the back door open. A thief, when they come to your house, they won't come through the armored plate and front door. They'll look for an open window that you left open. Come on. Devil's no different. Then look what he goes on, the next verse. Beware lest anybody captures you through philosophy, vain deceit, in the traditions of men and the elementary principles of the world and not after Christ. Basokwena, that anybody captures you. Now how many sitting here this morning and watching on, on, on stream will understand we hate state capture. What I hate more than state capture is church capture. We're the church, I'm not talking about a building, I'm talking about the living body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where the church has been captured and held captive to vain philosophies and the rubbish of this world. No, but Derek, we're not captured. Okay, they ask you. Seeing as you brought it up, see. What philosophy has captured you? I'll tell you one. Political ideology has captured people above the knowledge of Christ and above His word. We would wear, rather wear, and you've got freedom of expression, you're free to choose, but you'd rather wear your political attire than wear your godly attire. Come on, baby. You'd rather march for a political cause than march for the righteousness of the gospel. Mm. You're captured. I don't know how you spell it, but you're captured. When, when, when credit cards, banks, and, and financial houses entice you to take another card and extend your credit to buy things that you don't need with money that you don't have, you're captured. Yes, Lord. When Delilah entices you to break your covenant with God, you're captured. Yes. No, the church is not captured. Fuck, let me tell you, the church is captured. And it's time we get uncaptured. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen. 
But we ought to know what we're captured into so that we don't want to break out of God's own. Vain deceit in the traditions of men. Tribalism. Ancestral worship is capturing us into the traditions of our family's past. No, my, fam my daddy did it like that. My granddad did it like that. My great granddad did it like that. And I'm going to do it like that too. You're captured. You're captured. The elementary principles of the world. What are the elementary? You see, when you start reading it, and I don't know how many of you read the scripture in your Bible, when it says you are captured by the elementary principles of this word, did you ever stop to ask yourself or ask God, what are the elementary principles of this word, of the world, excuse me, that capture me? Well, I'll tell you now. Just give you a few. Materialism. Seeking after things. When God says, seek first the kingdom, and he'll just give you the things. Amen. Seeking fame and fortune instead of being humble. See, the world talks about your success. You've got to promote yourself. You've got to put yourself out there. Come on, someone. That's a principle of the world. Even when I was young and growing up, I couldn't understand it back in my day when television was first becoming prominent. Now today it's, a, 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 quite a, it's not novel anymore. When I first came to South Africa, I found people here in South Africa sitting for hours watching the test pattern. Broadcast hadn't started yet, but they watched the test pattern. I couldn't understand. I came from a country that had television. Press an orange picture. South Africa in, the eight, in, the, in 1981 was sitting watching the test pattern. <laughs> 74, well, whenever it was, yeah. They were watching the test pack. That's indicative of a society looking for something they can't see. But then when television came, and the type of adverts that were flaunted in those days, just go back and look at them. Look at the adverts that are, that are aired and flighted today. It's all about materialism. It's all about prominence and position, and notoriety. The philosophies, the principles of this world capture the church. Yeah, I've, watched, I've watched some folk, and please, don't, don't take me out of context. There's some, there's some folk out there in the world today that have stayed out of the systems of this world, like the Amish in America. They still ride a pony and trap, a little buggy with a horse in the front. <laughs> I don't want big automobiles and flashy automobiles. Now, unfortunately, their motivation is the fear of modern life, not the concern of being entrapped, but it's the fear of modern life. But church, this morning, what are we trapped by? What are you trapped by? What's trapped us? It says here that we were captured by the traditions of men and the elementary principles of this world that are not after Christ. What did you do there? If you take, remember, it's very simple. Since last Sunday to today, there's been 168 hours go past. And every week it's the same 168 hours. Same number. How much of our week did we spend after Christ? And how much of our week did we spend after the fundamental principles of this world? Uh, listen, there's some practical stuff. I'm not getting away from that. We need to eat. We need to sleep. We need to, you know, those things. Those are practical. But what are we chasing? What are we chasing? If I ask you to take your vision, and those who haven't yet done your spiritual development plan, please do your spiritual development plan. Most of you have got a career development plan. Most of you have got a, a life development plan. But have you built and written a spiritual development plan? Because if you haven't, you're not going to go where God wants you to go. Let me tell you, whether we like it or not, whether we're conscious of it or not, or not we follow after our heart. 
a man who wants to have a relationship with another woman outside of his marriage will follow his heart into trouble. You can tell him it's wrong, or she for that matter, let's not always blame the man. You can tell him it's wrong, but you know what he'll say, yes, 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 and still do it. Why? Because he's following his heart, see? Where's your heart this morning? Is your heart after Jesus? Is your heart cemented to the rock? Christ Jesus. For in Him we live. For in Him we live. And all the fullness of the Godhead bodily lives in us. Church, we don't live in materialism. We don't live in the, in the elementary principles of this world, we live in Christ. Have we made in our mind, have we made in our soul, and have we made in our spirit that fundamental shift, that fundamental change that we live in Christ? See, many people live in the world and just have Christ as their Savior. You know, if you want to leave the borders of this country, you've got to have a passport. Am I right? No. To leave legally. To leave legally. Some people leave illegally. But to leave legally, you've got to have a passport. And to leave legally with a passport, you've got to go through a proper place called the border post. That's just how it is. Well, to get into heaven, you've got to have a passport. It's the blood of Jesus. And the entry point is Jesus Christ. For no man cometh to the Father but through him. He's the, he's the border post. Praise God. In that sense. In him we have everything we need, church. We don't need anything other than Jesus. Because in him is the fullness of the Godhead body dwelleth in us. You are complete in him. Paul saying to the church. You're complete in Him. You see, this bottle, you can't see too well because it's a colored bottle. And you all got a, a normal see-through plastic bottle for me? Oh, thanks. You've heard me say this before, I'm going to say it again, and now you all know the answer so you won't make a mistake. I put it to you. This bottle is full. I put it to you, this bottle is full. It may not be full of water, but it's full. It's got some water and it's got some air, but it is full. The Bible says, Paul declares to the church that we are what? Complete or full in Him. But if we choose to be only half in Him, guess what? Then we've also chosen to allow another half in our life. Church, what are we full of today? Are we full of Christ? Or are we a mix of Christ and the world systems? Of Christ and ourself? Of Christ and proud or pride and arrogance? What are we full of this morning? And you see, as I take this bottle and I start pouring in water with the top open, guess what happens to the other stuff? It leaves. How do we get more Christ in us? Just put him in. <laughs> How do we get rid of the bad? Put more Christ in. Because the more you put the water in, the air has to go. It can't both coexist in the same bottle and occupy the same space. One of the laws of physics, two particles of matter cannot occupy the same space. That's what it says. In our lives, who are we? We are in Christ, full and complete. But when we leave Christ out of an area of our life, we're incomplete. And that vacuum gets filled up with something other than Christ. Now, folks, listen. You've got to hear me this morning. It's okay to acknowledge we've got a problem. But then it's not okay to stay there. 
It's okay to acknowledge we've got a problem, but it's not okay to stay here. Because we need to get it filled, see? Soak it. Worship. Worship is one of the fundamental things. Just to come and soak in His presence. What are we doing? We're filling ourselves. We're allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us. As He fills us, the other stuff will come out and go. See, here's a test. And I'm just saying this, Dolph, and I'm not picky on you, so please don't, don't be upset with me. You can't be in the presence of God like we were on Tuesday night and want to pick up a beer at the same time and drink a beer. Am I right? Yes. I've never tried that because I'm not that dumb. But I'm telling you right now, you cannot. It's an impossibility of spirit to be in the presence of God in that dimension of anointing and want to put something, alien substance in your body at the same time. It's just impossible. So if that's true, then how do we stay away from intoxication of alcohol? We get in the spirit. How do we get in the spirit? Well, we worship. Ask you a question, how many of you have got great worship music in your car? Or access to worship music in your car? Whether it's on your phone, or it's in a CD, or it's in a memory stick, you've got access, right? Amen. Everybody's got it. But now you're in traffic and it's a little irritating and it's not going well. Do you put on the worship music? Yes. Louder. Do you saturate yourself in the presence? <laughs> or do you fill yourself with the anger and frustration of the traffic? You see, we have a choice. What fills us? Well, I just put on worship and I turn up the volume and I get lost. It doesn't matter whether I stand still for half an hour or we move slowly for half an hour. I'm in the presence of God for half an hour. Amen. When I get out the other side, I'm just like, oh, hallelujah. But if I'm not in the presence of God, I have to be in the presence of something else. Because we're never outside of a presence. If a husband and wife are fighting, having a disagreement, arguing, not in unity, not on the same page. Now, if you notice, those are just scales of trouble. How do you fix it? Well, you can go out to dinner. That's great. You just take the problem with you. Or you get into the presence of God and you just worship. And as you're filled with the power of God in your life, you look at your spouse, you look at your partner, and just see Jesus. Because at that time, they're also filling, see? Now you don't see the blemishes and you don't see the problems. You see Jesus. Hey, my baby, I'm sorry. I see Jesus in you. What, were, what was that we were on about? Because I see Jesus. In but if we focus on the half emptiness, that's where we'll stay. Focused on the half emptiness. We need to focus on Jesus. Can you say again something? Amen. See, I don't need to do a 20 week course. I need to do 20 weeks of worship. And worship's not the answer to everything. I'm not saying bury your head in the sand. There's some practical stuff. Yeah. You can't be cheating on your wife and say, well, let's just worship. Okay, let me just put that into context, especially for my international viewers. Okay? That's also done. But worship brings the presence of God into us. It opens us up to allow God to come and flow and saturate every fiber of our being. You see, we are complete in Christ, who is the head of all authority and power. See, when Christ is the head of our authority and power, we won't usurp power. We won't usurp authority. We won't try and lord it over anybody or anything. We'll just let Christ be. That's where God wants us to be. Then he goes on to talk about the circumcision, circumcision not made with hands, but it's the circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of sin and of the flesh. Putting off. If I had a jacket right now, how do I get the jacket off? Well, I physically take it off. I put it off. 
How do you get rid of pride? You take it off. How do you get rid of bitterness? You take it off. He says, take off or put off the flesh, the body of sin. Putting it off, putting it down, putting it aside, laying it under, whatever word you want to use, whatever your translation says. But it's a physical act of not doing it. You see, I'm, I'm tired, church, when I hear people say this. And you might have used that, that thing yourself. Shame on you. The devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do nothing. You did it all on your own. The devil tempted you, but you did it. Amen? He enticed you. I remember counseling somebody, a very prominent person in our country. And they had been trapped, see? And some hidden cameras had captured their stupidity. And now it was being used as a, a weapon, a political weapon, to destroy them and disgrace them as a politician. And a politician wanting to rise to prominence in their political structure. And we were sitting with the seniors and this dear man was protesting his innocence. Nothing happened. I can promise you, nothing happened. And I asked him, I said, well, it did happen. No, nothing happened, Gary. I said, well, you were in a hotel room in your silkies with a woman that's not your wife. Something happened. Whether you slept with her or whether you didn't, she got you to destroy your own moral fiber, to be in a hotel room in the first place where you're a married man, to be undressed with a foreign woman who's not your wife. And you sit there and you tell me nothing happened. Something happened. Thank God it wasn't all, all that happened, but something happened. You need to go home to your wife and you need to say something. You need to repent. Don't go home and deny nothing happened, lovey. Because lovey's not going to understand nothing happened. And it's the same with God. Sometimes we stand before God and say, Lord, nothing happened. But it did happen. In our heart, we put bitterness. In our heart, we put rejection. In our mouth, we put slander. And we stand and say, nothing happened, Lord. But it did happen, see? Because it was already in your heart. Even though you might not have carried through the action, something did happen. It was already in your heart. We need pure hearts today, church. We need the power of God to be in us that we are pure. Are you learning something this morning? Amen. See, I'll, I'll finish with this and we'll carry on because I, I thought we'd get through chapter 2 today but it looks like we're not. It says we're, we're, the, we're, we're baptized with the baptism and the, un, the circumcision not made with hands. We're buried with Him in baptism. Now that's not just the water, that's the filling of the Holy Ghost. We're baptized into Christ. We're immersed in Christ. Amen? In which also we were raised with him through the faith of the power of God. How are you raised this morning? Now I want to just see, see we're going to be here. I'm not knocking tradition. And I'm not knocking family. I want to add to what you have. How are you raised this morning? Most people talk about how they were raised by their family or how they weren't raised by their family. You and I, when we got born again, from the day we got born again, the day we got water baptized, we started to be raised by the faith of God. Amen. What it says here. We're raised by the faith of God. What's the only thing that will raise you up? The faith of God. The only thing that will get us to the victory in Christ Jesus is the faith of God. And the faith in God. This is not our faith. 
Because then we're doing it our way, we're doing it with our ability, we're doing it with our, our, our power. No, it's not my faith, it's the faith of God. The power of God in me. Church, I want to ask you. There's church that's in family. There's church that are outside of family. Those leopards, who are they looking for right now? And the cheetahs and the lions. Who are they looking for right now? They're not looking for those in the middle of the herd. They're looking for those that are isolated from them. Because they're quick kills, they're easy kills. See? How many... Have you ever seen a pack of dogs? A real pack of dogs? They're all biting at you at the same time. Which one do you hit first? It's hard to defend yourself against a pack of dogs. Not because, and I mean some of them argue this, yeah, you're high. But there's just too many of them, see? But let one of those little blocks come on his own, he's no, he's no problem. But when they come in numbers, and you're isolated, you're in trouble. Church, I want to encourage you this morning. If you're not in a family, and you're not committed in a fellowship, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Because no one can be a one-man band in the last days. Number one, firstly, God says we're family. If I cut this finger off, take it away from the body, it doesn't do well on its own. The whole body hurts. If any of you men, especially because they're more pro prone than women, if you've ever had gout, just that little toe, How's the rest of your body? It ain't doing well. Come on. It's in agony. And there's days I've heard men say, just cut the toe off. No, well, you won't do well without the toe either. <laughs> so rather get rid of it down. But it's so excruciatingly painful, they're willing even to sacrifice a toe. Because they don't know the consequences of losing the toe. But you see, when I cut the finger off, the whole body hurts. But the finger dies. Right now, the body of Christ hurts, but the, the cut off people are busy dying. When you cut flowers out of your garden, and you, you cut them and you put them in a vase of water, and you can put those little powders that the florists give you to keep the flowers longer, they look like they're still alive, but they're actually dying. You just can't see it yet. And any member of the body of Christ that gets separated from the family of God is busy dying. And that's been the tactic of the enemy. See, if I want to kill those flowers, I don't have to poison the bush. I just cut them off from the bush and they die. There's too many church folk that are cut off from the family. And if you don't like the pastor you are with, if you don't like the fellowship you are in, go find another one. But don't stay out of fellowship. Don't stay isolated. Yes. You're not as tough as you think you are, believe me. Because if you can get that tough, chances are you've hardened your heart. Chances are you've become bitter. You've become twisted. That's not what God wants. Churches, we worship this morning. I'm not going to have an altar call. I'm not going to have body ministry. I'm not going to lay hands and pray. But as we worship, I want you to say, Lord, I want to come back to serving you for the right reason. I want to come back to honoring you and worshiping you for the right reason. It's because I love you. It's not because I can get something from you. It's not because I want something. It's not because I'm in trouble. It's not because I fear hell. I'm just coming to worship you. Lord, I ask you as I worship you this morning, if there's any philosophies in me that are the elementary principles of this word and not the principles of Christ, Lord, reveal them to me so that I may get rid of them in my life. Thanks, baby. Amen. Amen. See, that's what that's what that's what Paul was telling in the Colossians. And if you read the, the epistles all the way through the Bible, you see that they're not just 40 pages or, or 40 verses, they're packed with the truth of life. Church, don't be a victim to your circumstance. 
Don't be a victim to your own slothfulness. Don't be a victim to, well, this is, you know, I can't change. God gave me this, I'll just endure it. That's not going to change. The world's looking at you right now for the solution and the answer. And the only way we can be the solution and the answer is to live a victorious life in Christ Jesus. Amen. I know we have bad days. I know we have tough days, and that's okay. When I started my, my, my treatment for cancer, I said to Velma, let's understand something, let's be real. I'm going to have good days and bad days. I'm never going to have terrible days, but I'm going to have good days and bad days. And as the Lord comes and touches my body and heals my body, I'm going to have bad days and better days. Then I'm going to have bad days and better weeks. Then I'm going to have bad days and better months. You see, I was changing the ratio. It wasn't a one-to-one. -one. It wasn't equal anymore. We were changing it. And when we got to one of those days that were a bad day, I could praise God and say, Lord, you know, for the last three weeks I've had good days. So we just got one bad one here. It'll last for a few hours and we'll be back to good days again. But if I stayed bogged down in the bad day, I would have been flat. It's okay to have a bad day. As long as you know you can get out of your bad day and have a good week. Amen? Amen. Don't be bewitched. Don't be bedraggled. Don't be captured by the world. All because a thousand people are doing it doesn't mean it's right. Church, I want to tell you, if you are pro-abortion, you're anti-God. Yes, you have freedom of choice. The Constitution of South Africa gives you that freedom. God gave you freedom as well. But he said, I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life that you may live. Choose life that you may live. Don't be aligned to something that's not biblical. Amen? Let me ask your heart. Think about this for a moment. How does your heart feel about a bullet in the head? Well, the heart didn't get hit, see? But how does the heart feel about a bullet in the head? The same as the toe. Dead. One thing can destroy you. Don't align to anything that's not God. Because it will destroy you.